Hi everybody, chapter 37 goes over transport operations and it's a pretty humdrum chapter, but let's get started and we'll go from there. So I'm going to let you read these. I'm not going to read them to you. This will give you a second to kind of review. And please feel free to pause the video if I click forward too quickly. All right, so today's ambulances are stocked with the um, standard medical supplies and a state-of-the-art technology that transmits data directly to the emergency departments. And this is something that we've had for a long time, but the technology is kind of getting better and making it a little bit more simplistic and a lot cleaner on the trans transmission. So today's emphasis on rapid response places EMTs in a greater level of danger. We're going to look at that. So an ambulance is a vehicle that's used for treating and transporting patients who need emergency medical care to a hospital. And today's ambulance designs are based on the NFPA's 1917 standard for automotive ambulances. An enlarged, typically the emergency vehicle is designed to have an enlarged patient compartment First responder vehicles have personnel and equipment to treat patients until the ambulance arrives. So that's a big difference. Um, some areas and some jurisdictions actually have uh, first responders that are specific for that category. They don't transport, they just provide um, a, a continuity of care from the time of onset uh, to have a quicker response and allow us to get there in a timely manner without having to impact patient care in a negative way. So the components of a modern ambulance include the driver's compartment and a patient compartment that's supposed to be big enough for at least two ambulances and two supine patients. It's going to carry our equipment and supplies and also include two-way radio communication and it's designed for maximum safety and comfort, although um, I say comfort and I'm going to use that with relative terms because I don't think it's quite as comfortable as they like it to be. So the basic ambulance designs come in three types. There's a type one, type two, and type three. Big shock there, right? So type one is a conventional ambulance with a truck cab chassis. It has a modular ambulance body that can be transferred to a newer chassis as needed. So these are the ones um, that have uh, uh, like a small box to, to look through from front to th from the front where the driver is to the back to have a little box. The Type 2 is a standard van ambulance and this has the forward control integral cab body design and then the Type 3 is the specialty van cab or a mod, they sometimes will call them mini mods, you'll hear them referred to as mini mods, but the Type 3 is a modular ambulance body that's mounted on a cutaway uh, van chassis. So the mini mods are the ones that you can actually walk from the patient compartment directly through into the front where the, um, the driver is. And ambulance licensing or certification standards are established by the states. Uh, one thing that is important and has to be affixed to the ambulance is the Star of Life. And that emblem is fixed not only to the sides rear but also to the roof of the ambulance so that it can be spotted from uh, helicopters. And again here are those three types. You can see type 1 is the very first one at the top corner. Then you have the standard type 2 with the, the, the van and then the mini mod is what you see on the bottom and that's your type 3. So when it comes to the phases of an ambulance call, it's always going to start out where you're preparing for the call, you become dispatched. So part of that preparation for the call is making sure that you have all of the equipment that you need in order to function properly. So we always refer to that as, um, um, I think the, the term used is, is critical critical call equipment. So you want to make sure that you're, you're capable of handling that critical incident or that critical call. So then you're going to be dispatched and during the dispatch you 
you get that information, you start moving in route to the um, location of the incident, uh, that's when you're actually thinking, and this is kind of integrating some thought patterns that you're going to learn as you move forward in the class. But when you're in route to the call, that's when you want to consider all the possible causes. You want to kind of have an idea in your mind of what you may or may not have to deal with when you get there, because that kind of helps you pre-plan and prep for what you can encounter and give you a better sense of control over the situation. So once you've arrived at the scene, you're going to take care of that patient at that point, and you're going to transfer that patient into the ambulance. You're going to drive to the, send, to the receiving facility. That's part of your transport. And then you're going to deliver that patient to the receiving facility. So that's the delivering or the receiving. Uh, you're at the receiving facility itself. After that, you want to clean, reset your ambulance, be prepped for the next call, and go en route back to the station. And it's important to have your truck mission ready again uh, for that en route to the station because you never know. You may be en route to back to uh, station one or wherever you're located and you get a call before you even make it back. So you want to make sure you have all those mission critical things, those items in place and that's your mission ready uh, before you leave that receiving facility. So you want to make sure you have everything prepared. If you don't have everything prepared or you're missing something critical or you've ran out of something critical, a good example is oxygen. So you've you've used all of your oxygen supply and you have to get it restocked, it's important to remember that you want to remain out of service until that mission critical item has been replaced. So oxygen would be considered a mission critical item. And then you're going to do the post run and that's where you're, um, you know, you're finalizing, you're putting the last little bits of things together or those things that you may have used on the previous call that need to be restocked. Um, you're finishing any paperwork that's left behind and getting that taken care of. Uh, so this is kind of probably going to run through everything I just said, but we'll just kind of go through it really quickly. So make sure your equipment and supplies are in their proper places and ready for use. You know, check and make sure that your fuel is where it should be, that your um, all your fluids in the truck are the way they are supposed to be, and I mean fluids is in um, you know, transmission fluid, oil, that sort of thing. Store new equipment only after proper instruction on its use. Um, here we do a lot with uh, uh, video, con video lectures where this, the employees can kind of see what the equipment is and then we'll bring everybody in afterwards to do a skill check and, and a question and answer session. But the equipment should be durable and standardized. Store your equipment and supplies according to how urgent they are. You don't want to have a bag valve mask, which we use to maintain airway and oxygenation and ventilate for that patient. You don't want to have that bag valve mask stored at the very back of the truck compartment. You want to have it up close to the airway where the head is because that's where you're going to be reaching to grab. It doesn't make a lot of sense to have that stored on a shelf at the back corner next to the back doors of the ambulance when the head of the patient is at the front of the truck. So we want to make sure we place things where they're supposed to be. And items for cardiac care, external bleeding, and blood pressure should be at the side of the stretcher or someplace close, maybe the bench seat. So you do have cabinets and drawers and these should be for, they, they need to be transparent for one, and they should be labeled or you should be able to look in and identify what you're dealing with. And uh, in some cases, some agencies actually secure or do a lockout system with those cabinets, and that's going to depend on the agency you work for. Some additional medical equipment that gets forgotten and, and I'm bringing this up because I see the picture in the PowerPoint presentation here. That is a portable suction unit, that red bag with that you see at the top there, that's a portable suction unit. Always check that portable suction. Make sure it still has a charge. The last thing you want to do is get on the call where you need that to maintain the airway to keep that patient from aspirating gastric or stomach contents into their lungs you don't want them to not have the suction available because you forgot 
to charge that unit. Now that, that unit is, once it's charged, it can stay charged for several days, and that's the problem. People forget to check it and make sure that you've got a proper charge on that, that unit. So always double check that. Your airway and ventilation equipment also, that's part of that mission critical criteria. Some CPR equipment, as you can see here, is, is showing that orange um, board, and that's kind of a CPR board. And then you also want to include some basic wound care supplies, some bandages, gauze, and the like. So again, you can kind of see here you have splinting supplies. Childbirth supplies are important. You want to make sure that you do have that, they call them obstetrical kits. So you want to make sure that the obstetrical kits are on your truck and that you have at a minimum an AED. Um, some of the trucks actually carry monitors, uh, EKG monitors that are ran and used by paramedics, but those cardiac monitors have an AED um, function to them. So some agencies have diverted away instead of saying, you know, we're going to have an AED here and then also have a cardiac monitor here. They've just combined it and they've said, all right, we're just going to put these cardiac monitors on every truck that have AED capability. So you always want to make sure before you take that truck out and start running any calls in it, make sure you know how to use that cardiac monitor in the AED mode. Some additional things that you want to consider is the patient transfer equipment. So we're talking about the stretcher or the cot here. You want to make sure that that cot is operable. You want to make sure that you have it dressed with the appropriate um, you know, sheets and pillowcases. And remember your environment that you're in. Granny does not like to get cold. How many times have you walked into your grandma's house and it's 90 degrees in the middle of summer and she says it's cold? So make sure that you have appropriate blankets or sheets available to keep that patient comfortable. You also want to make sure that you have the appropriate medications. And remember that West Virginia EMTs can do a little bit more than National Registry EMTs when it comes to medication um, to, to your patients. So make sure you have all your medications available and have that jump kit. And essentially a jump kit or a first out bag is what's used when you first get out of the ambulance. That first out bag at a minimum should be at your side when you go to see that patient. Now uh, this is actually a picture of an ambulance that has an external um, side compartment where you can see the personal safety equipment is located in here. But that may also not be an option when you look at the van ambulances. That Type 2 van doesn't have external uh, compartments like this. So you may find those inside your truck. Make sure you have any pre-planning and navigation equipment and extrication equipment if it's carried with your unit. Now here at Princeton we have a separate um, uh, crash truck, as they call it, that has all that extrication equipment already in it. If you're not trained to use the equipment, please don't try to do something you're not trained to do. Please make sure you attend the training sessions. We offer those, so if you have an interest in learning about extrication equipment and understanding how it functions so that you can respond with the crash truck, please attend that class. We usually have it once a year. At least one EMT in the patient compartment needs to be in the back with the patient during transport. Uh, they do recommend that you have two EMTs in the back on any patient, but let's just face it, that's not optional in most cases. Now, if you have a critical patient, you can always call for backup to have that extra set of hands in the back of the truck, but on your typical uh, daily transports, that's not going to be the option for you. You're going to be the lone man in the back. Some services have a non-EMT driver and a single EMT in the patient compartment. That is a possibility. Here at Princeton Rescue Squad, we don't offer that. At Princeton Rescue Squad, you have to be at least EMT certified um, in order to work on the ambulance. Now, there are cases when we run short on, on personnel, and you may see um, some of our office staff that have been certified to drive the ambulance, but that's about the only time you're going to see a case where you have someone who's not an EMT 
uh, working as a driver or in the capacity of a driver on the ambulance with you as that EMT. So again, this preparation phase includes doing those daily inspections and that's where you're looking to make sure that you have everything that you need, that your ambulance is clean, and that you have the quantity and the function of the medical equipment and supplies that are necessary. It's all about being mission critical and having that equipment prepared. So review any safety precautions, look at your traffic safety rules and regulations, it's really important. Um, ensure safety devices are in working order, that the O2 tanks are secured uh, carefully and properly. Um, I can't stress that enough because should the worst happen, knock on wood, you are involved in a, an ambulance crash, those things, anything that's not properly secured becomes a moving object in the back of the truck that is very good at hitting you. So you want to make sure you secure all equipment and compartments properly. Now during the dispatch phase, uh, it, can be, uh, it can be operated by the local EMS or by shared service. So in a lot of cases you'll see that the EMS agencies here in West Virginia have each agency has their own dispatching center that usually works in coordination with a local county 911 center. And it may only serve one jurisdiction or it may be an area or a regional center. So again, that's part of that dispatching phase and you'll kind of understand that more as you work with your individual agencies. But your dispatchers are going to provide you with some very important information. The nature of the call, uh, the name and present location, the callback number, where that person is located, if there's more than one patient on scene and what their severity of the condition is, and any other pertinent information. But please understand that what a dispatcher collects on that dispatching phase is not always what you see. It's not uncommon to show up on a scene where you're supposed to be walking into a cardiac arrest to only find two guys that are drunk and one guy's trying to do CPR on another guy that's just passed out on the couch sleeping. So that's not anything unusual. Um, be aware that dispatchers can only give you the quality of information that they receive. So while you're en route to the scene, this is the most dangerous phase for an EMT. Crashes cause many serious injuries. You want to make sure that your seat belts and shoulder harnesses are in place and buckled in before you take off in the truck and review your dispatch information. And again, this is where you're kind of reassessing and kind of thinking about what you should encounter and what you need to prep for once you arrive on scene. When you're there, some of the first things you're going to do is assess for any safety hazards that are out there. Evaluate the need for additional units. The minute you realize you need additional help, don't wait. Call for that extra crew. Whatever it is that you need, make sure you call for it because the longer you wait means the longer you're sitting at that scene with that patient. And I always say that the best way to secure your scene is to have that patient in the back of your truck because that's your office and you have more direct control over what happens in your office than someone does if you walk into another person's home. There's a lot more unknowns that are there. So determine the mechanism of injury. So we want to figure out what has happened to that patient. How did they get injured? Or what is the nature of the illness? What's going on with them today? What's, what has made them sick? How do they feel? And evaluate the need for spinal immobilization. And we want to make sure that we have our own body substance isolation in place. You can get prepped for that BSI or body substance isolation before you ever <clears throat> arrive on the scene. If it's a mass casualty incident, that, so you have more patients than you can manage. That's important. Mass casualty incidents is when you have more patients than can be managed, period. That's a mass casualty incident. Anytime you run into that, all normal um, patient care assessments and everything kind of go out the window. Nothing is going to be typical in a mass casualty situation. Every single MCI I've been to has always been different. So please take it from me. I have more experience with MCIs than, than uh, you may realize. 
And I'm telling you, each one of those always turned out different. And I walked away from every MCI learning a brand new piece of information or something that I could take away and use on the next MCI I encounter. So you want to estimate and communicate the number of patients to the incident commander, request additional units through dispatch, and the incident command system is something that you're going to be taught and that's going to be established and utilized at this point. You want to make sure that you park in a safe manner that allows for access and egress. So we mean the ability to get into the scene and then the ability to get out. I've been on several calls in my career where you have a bunch of ambulances that are all responding to the same incident and they all kind of bottleneck up right into that one single solitary component. So make sure that you allow for good efficient traffic flow and control in and out of that emergency scene. Make sure you park 100 feet before or past the crash scene and do not park alongside a crash. You want to make sure that you park uphill and upwind and that's that's important. You're going to see that on testing, I promise you. If you have a hazmat situation, if you have a hazardous material incident and you are responding to that call, make sure you park uphill and upwind and leave your warning lights and devices on. Now we're not talking about the siren, but we are talking about the warning lights and keep a safe distance between emergency vehicle and operations. So here is a good example, and there's a specific program that's actually called TIMS, it's Traffic Incident Management System. It's a specialized course you can take on the side. TIMS kind of teaches you how to coordinate uh, multiple responding units to make your scene as safe as you can, because our roadways are probably the most um, dangerous because we have people that are rubbernecking as they drive by, they're looking, they're like, what is going on over there? and that's going to put you in a, in a critical situation. So usually your fire trucks are going to try to park to where they block off any traffic that's coming through and that's what you're seeing in this picture. You're seeing that the fire truck has blocked the traffic, it's forcing them to move over. The theory and the mentality is is that if a car refuses to get over for that fire truck, at least it's taken out the fire truck and it's a pretty heavy object, so it's going to be hard to move that object very far and it's going to protect you who should be inside that, that zone of safety and try to take care of that patient without having to worry about oncoming traffic. So stay away from fires, explosive hazards, downed wires, and unstable structures. Make sure you set your parking brake and facilitate emergency medical care and rapid transport from the scene. And if it's necessary, go ahead and block traffic and work quickly and safely. Keep your eyes open. You need to be on a swivel that entire time. You need to be aware of where your partner is, where the patient bystanders. You need to kind of have your eyes open and be aware of everything around you. Traffic control, you want to provide care and ensure scene safety first and foremost before anything else. Traffic control is intended to ensure orderly traffic flow, to warn other drivers, and prevent another crash. And place warning devices on both sides of the crash. This is where we're including those flashes or the flares, if you will. Now during the transfer phase, the patient has been packaged. We've put them on our cot. You can see in this picture that they've got them um, on the cot and they're securing the straps. Uh, so you want to make sure that they are secured in place. They're not going to go flying anywhere. Lift the patient into the compartment and secure them, uh, secure the cot directly in. When you're ready to leave with the patient, you need to let dispatch know that you're headed to whatever the receiving hospital is. You need to tell them that location that you're going to and the number of patients. It does say beginning mileage of the ambulance, but you don't have to inform dispatch of that. Um, that's something that you're going to write in your documentation. And I'm not aware of any, any agency in West Virginia that requires you to inform dispatch of beginning not mileage. This is something that usually is handled on the paperwork side. So you want to monitor your patient's condition while you're en route to the receiving facility. And it's really important to remember this. If your patient is sick, 
if they are considered unstable, they are sick, they need to be reassessed every five minutes. If your patient is not sick, if they're not critical, they are stable. If that patient is stable, you can reassess them every 15 minutes. And during that transport phase, you're going to contact the receiving facility, let them know that you're on your way, and let them know how far out you are. That kind of gives them a chance to call in um, certain teams that may be needed for that patient's continuity of care. So a good example would be a stroke patient. They don't always have all the members of the team that would handle stroke care at the receiving facility. They're not all in the ER waiting anxiously at the door for your arrival just 24 hours a day, seven days a week. They are given different jobs and tasks to do at different locations within the hospital itself. So by telling them how far you out, how far you are out from the re receiving facility, gives them time to to call or page those individuals over their intercom system or telecommunications, however they do that, so that they can all get them to the um, to the receiving area in the ER and await your arrival. So you definitely want to do that. Do not abandon the patient emotionally. Um, you need to be aware of the patient's level of need. And I'm going to put a caveat in here. There are certain patients that are so unstable that you have to maintain their airway, their breathing, and their circulation. If you don't have time to explain everything or talk to that patient, that is understandable. But in the majority of cases where we care for patients in the back of our truck, we need to maintain an engagement with that patient and care for them emotionally. Remember, you are that patient's best advocate and you need to stay engaged with that person and remain aware of their personal needs as you go along. It means that we have to read the patient very carefully. During the delivery phase, you're going to let dispatch know that you've arrived at the hospital and you're going to report you're arriving to the triage nurse and there's usually a set um, criteria that happens at each facility. Rely on your partner, the one that's been working for a while. They can kind of guide you. And you're going to have to physically transfer that patient over to the receiving cot at the facility and give a verbal report usually to the nurse. And that's going to give you, you also want to provide them with what care you provided. And then when you're done with all that, you're going to be able to write your patient care report restock your items. A lot of times whoever runs the patient care is the one doing the, the narrative working on the report while the, the driver is restocking the ambulance or cleaning it out as the case may be. When you're en route to the station, inform dispatch whether you are in service or whether, where you're going. And that's what I was talking about at the beginning. Remember I said you have to make sure that your mission criticals are in place. If you don't have those, then you need to take care of that um, and tell them that you're not in service yet. You've got to go pick up oxygen, for example. Um, back at the station, make sure that whatever you did not clean and disinfect is completely done and that you've restocked your supplies. And to be honest, that cleaning and disinfecting the cot, doing those major cleanings, need to be done at the facility while you're trying to get that patient offloaded and getting yourself re reset in service. The post run phase, you complete and file additional written reports, uh, inform dispatch of your location and the time and what your availability is. And remember, it's all about making sure you're ready for that next call and perform any routine inspections you may have or refuel the vehicle if necessary. So some key terms that often get dis, uh, get confused is cleaning, disinfecting. There are high levels of disinfection. I'm not so much concerned about that as I am cleaning, disinfection, and sterilizing. We try to keep our environment clean. We want it to be medically clean. We don't want to have them rolling around in the mud in the back of our ambulance. We want to keep the ambulance clean. Disinfection, it's really important to understand that disinfecting means that we're using a cleaning agent that's not meant to go on the skin. This is a disinfectant. We're trying to kill all germs 
and vi bacteria, viruses, whatever it may be, we're trying to kill those germs. By disinfecting, we're getting rid of germs. Um, sterilization. Kayla Terry, 911. Sorry about that. Uh, when it comes to sterilization, uh, and I guess we'll say hi to Helen because I forgot to turn the phone off. Um, when it comes to sterilization, we have gotten rid of every germ possible. So that's more like what you see in surgery when they clean themselves and they scrub themselves down and they're opening these packages with equipment. And they're handling them in a very specific manner. It's because those items have been sterilized and they are completely free of any germs or any foreign materials that may not uh, be, be good for the patient to be exposed to. So after each call in this post-run phase, and like I said, we should be stripping the linens from the stretcher and placing them in the, the receptacle at the, the receiving facility, discarding any medical waste and washing any contaminated areas with soap and water. Now, when you're at the, the receiving facility, that's when you can go ahead and do some of that disinfecting. When you're you're using those those steri wipes, those those things that we have for disinfecting, you can use that at the sending facility. You don't have to wait to the post run phase to get that done. Disinfect any non disposable equipment, and here is a good point to bring up: probably the most contaminated items that we carry on an ambulance include our writing utensils. They include our stethoscope, because nobody thinks to clean the bell of the stethoscope or anything that you've touched that has also came in contact with the patient. So that stethoscope and your blood pressure cuff, those are probably the most, and your, your, your stretcher is the other one. But clean the stretcher with that germicidal solution. So again, we're talking about a disinfectant here. We want to clean any gross contamination and spillage and create a schedule for routine full cleaning of the emergency vehicle. And usually this is done in downtime. So you're not on a run 24 hours a day, seven days a week. There's going to be points where you're going to come back to station. You may have a lull. And while you're sitting around doing nothing, that's when you can actually go back and clean and scrub your ambulance down. And typically at the end of your shift, you're making sure that that ambulance is clean for the next crew coming in. So that's a really good time to make sure that the outside of the truck has been washed, the inside is reset and cleaned, and usually there is a policy and procedure in place for whatever agency you work for with regards to how that system is done. So there are some things to consider with defensive driving techniques, and we're going to talk about those now. Driver, te driver characteristics, um, you want to be physically fit, you need to be alert, you need to be emotionally mature and mentally stable, and you want to remember, this is probably most critical out of this slide, is re remaining with due regard for the safety of others and the preservation of property. So it's driving with due regard. It's always about the safety of those that are surrounding you. In terms of vehicle driving, um, yes, there is an emergency vehicle operating course or EVOC. Some places call it CVO. It's just a different version of the same class. But speed does not always save lives. Good care does. So wear your seat belts, your shoulder restraints. Remember, you're driving with due regard. So you want to make sure that you're driving with the understanding that the other vehicles are giving us permission to run lights and sirens and motivate, mo motiv not motivate, what is the word I'm looking for? Uh, navigate, navigate around them. Uh, so it's always about asking permission of the people around us. That's due regard. Stay in the extreme left-hand lane on multi-lane highways. It's very important because you were taught in high school, if you took driver's ed, that you always pull to the right to allow uh, emergency vehicles to pass on the left. That's that due regard. And so we're asking permission to pass them on the left. Siren risk versus benefit analysis. The decision to activate emergency lighting and sirens is going to depend a lot on your per the local protocols, 
patient condition and any anticipated clinical outcomes of the patient. So I can tell you beyond a shadow of a doubt that most of your um, the paramedics in particular are going to say, you know, once we have them in the back of the truck, they are they are as stable as they'll be. There's no need for lights or sirens. In the majority of cases, that's the way it will be. However, there are those calls where the patient is a little bit more critical. They're looking at the patient's current condition and they're anticipating clinical outcomes. And they're going to look at you and say, okay, go ahead and drive with lights and sirens. I will tell you that even though it happens, and I can say I've been there myself, um, I will tell my driver, just drive with lights, no siren. Let me know when you get to an intersection, you have to activate the siren so that we don't scare the patient. So I'm going to back up with that statement. That's something you don't want to do. Even though I'm telling you I've done it myself, it is illegal to drive without both lights and sirens activated. It's all or none. If you don't have the lights on and the siren at the same time, you are driving illegally in an emergency vehicle. So in most cases, if I'm in the, the back with a patient and they're critical, um, I'm going to tell you to just drive normally and I will care for them as best I can. If I think that we've got a clinical outcome, that means that we need to move quickly to definitive care, which is that, that receiving facility is considered definitive care. If I tell you we need to do that, go ahead and put on the lights and sirens. Um, just remember, you're going to work with partners and they're going to tell you lights only, no siren. I'm telling you that textbook and law will tell you otherwise. If you are running with that, that light without a siren going, you're driving illegally. So you always want to be defensive when driving and anticipate that motorists around you are going to do something unreliable and goofy. All right, they're either not going to hear your siren or they're not going to see anything and they're going to freak out at the last second and they're going to dodge and do all kinds of weirdness. Um, I can't tell you how many I've seen over the years. Uh, people will pull off to the side and then they think, oh, I can make it. And at the last second, they're going to dart across in front of you or do something weird. Um, intersections are the most dangerous place in the world. Let me repeat that. Intersections, while driving to the call, are the most dangerous things you will ever encounter. When you come up to an intersection, you should come to a complete and total stop. You need to make eye contact with every single driver in every single car that's around you that's at the front and make sure that you you understand and that they understand you're making the move to go through and they need to wait for you. And if they don't get it, then and they start to pull out, um, let them. Um, don't Don't fight for it. Don't be aggressive. You want to drive defensively. You want to be aware that they're going to do something silly. And if there's more than one ambulance en route to a call, uh, use, if you all are driving one behind the other, make sure you use in two different siren tones so that the other drivers will recognize, oh, there's two ambulances. It's not the same sound. They have some that's called the wail and yelp. You'll see these when you get in the ambulance kind of play around. There's you want to drive with two different sounds going. So whatever the first ambulance is using, if they're using the whale siren, then the second unit needs to use the Yelp. That way drivers around can recognize and identify there's more than one responding unit and they won't try to pull out in front of you. Because a lot of times what happens is they'll see that unit pass by and they'll go, okay, and they jump back onto the road and they have no idea that there's a second unit that's also trying to respond. Cushion of safety means that we want to maintain a safe following distance and try to avoid being tailgated from behind as much as possible. Ensure that blind spots do not prevent you from seeing vehicles or pedestrians. You always want to keep your head on a swivel. Have your partner needs to be engaged in that conversation with you. Never get out of the ambulance to confront a driver and be aware of blind spots and scan your mirrors frequently. 
Your excessive speed is, just, is considered unnecessary, dangerous, and does not improve the patient's chance of, of survival. And it makes it difficult to provide care in the back of the, with the patient. So if you're driving and your paramedic is in the back trying to work on a patient and you're driving like a maniac because you're driving with speed, um, with no regard to bumps and, and um, just general movement and trying to maintain balance in the back of a truck, it actually can hinder a lot uh, for that patient care. So make sure that you are aware that excessive speed is not necessary. It also hinders your ability to react in a timely manner and brake, and it increases the time and distance needed to stop. Siren syndrome is a thing where, as a new EMS person, um, you start using that siren and the lights, you actually want to drive faster and it's because you have that increase in the anxiety. Uh, just remember that, that you are prone to that when you first start out, especially when you first start out. And siren syndrome can hit even uh, experienced or, or a very, very long time running EMTs and paramedics alike if they have a call that's pretty critical. So if it's a, a injury to another healthcare worker or another EMS professional that maybe you know and you're responding to that call, you may have siren syndrome where you want to drive faster um, or if you have a child that's injured or sick, you may try to drive faster with those calls. Uh, just remember that's your anxiety talking, slow down. Um, one of the things that I've, I, I've, I've even done this before, I had someone that was driving for me um, that had never been on an ambulance in a critical situation and he was driving for the first time and we were going to a cardiac arrest and I told him when we got to the intersection he blew through the intersection I said don't do that again I said come to a complete stop I said that patient is not going to get any more stable than they currently are sad to say but cardiac arrest patient is not going to get worse <laughs> so there's no point in driving with um, that lack of due regard for everybody else around them. Crashes often occur when the vehicle is backing up, so we want to make sure we use a spotter, and the size and weight influence braking and stopping distances. Road positioning and cornering, you want to keep an ambulance in the proper lane when turning, and that means that you need to be aware of that curve and all of the, the forces um, are in play with your patient and with your your crew member in the back you want to make sure that you are anticipating these curves and you've slowed down to a proper speed to make that turn and to keep from having all of those again all of those forces kind of um, man, uh, manipulating and, and maybe causing harm to the back the patient in the back and the crew in the back Weather and road conditions is another thing to think about. Remember, ambulances are big things that are top heavy and they have a longer braking time and stopping distance. And the weight in the ambulance is unevenly distributed, which gives us a higher risk for being prone to roll. And be aware of hydroplaning or water on the highway, um, decreased visibility, ice and slippery surfaces. If you are on an emergency call and you are using your warning lights, you want to, uh, you may be allowed to do the following: park or stand in an illegal location, what would normally be considered illegal. Proceed through a red light or a stop sign. Drive faster than the posted speed limit. Drive against the flow of traffic, although I do not recommend that if you can help it. Travel left left of center to make an illegal pass. An emergency vehicle is never allowed to pass a school bus that has stopped to load or unload children. And I want to repeat this. If you have a school bus that is stopped and they are engaged in, in children loading and unloading, you are not allowed to pass. You have to wait for that bus driver to alert you and say that they have the all clear for you to be able to go through. Use of warning lights and sirens. Uh, the unit must be on a true emergency call and this is kind of goes back to what I said before. You have to use both the audible and visual warning devices 
have to be used simultaneously and it has to be operated with due regard. Right of way, we, uh, again, this, this is what I've already said, but we're going to repeat it. Emergency vehicles have the right to disregard the rules of the road when responding to an emergency, but it's with due regard, right of way privilege. We do not endanger people. We do not endanger property under any circumstances, and make sure you know what's appropriate in your area. If you are in a situation where you have an escort, you can use that escort if you're in a territory that you are unfamiliar with, but on daily uh, transports in your area, it is not advisable. Escorts increase the amount of danger. And remember, we said intersections are the most common site of a crash and the most serious. If you cannot wait for traffic lights to change, come to a brief stop. Remember, you're stopping and you're looking for pedestrians and other hazards and you want to get eye contact and understand every single person in that intersection knows what you're doing. Your highways, you can shut down emergency lights and sirens until you've reached the far left lane. Unpaved roads, you'll want to operate at a lower speed with a firm grip on the steering wheel because we don't want you to accidentally, um, not hydroplane, but but uh, skid off to the side because of loose rocks or gravel. And in a school zone, this is another one, it is unlawful to exceed the speed limit through a school zone. So if the school zone says that the speed limit is 10 miles an hour, then you must also go 10 miles an hour. Distractions. You want to focus on driving and anticipating roadway hazards, so you want to avoid the distractions as much as possible. Uh, this includes mobile dispatch terminals and GPS. Your partner needs to be focused on that, not you. Mounted mobile radio or stereo, cell phones, eating and drinking, all that needs to come to a complete stop, and you need to focus on what you're doing if you're driving that ambulance. Driving alone. It is your responsibility to focus on figuring out the safest route while mentally preparing for the call. Such situations demand your complete attention and focus. Fatigue. Um, at Princeton Rescue Squad, we do not allow individuals to work beyond, or we, we it's very rare that an individual works beyond 16 hours, and it's because of fatigue. The biggest thing that I've seen with a lot of EMS agencies that operate at 24-hour shifts is that the level of fatigue after they've been on call after call after call after call for the last 14 hours and they've had very little downtime or sleep time, that fatigue sets in, your judgment is not good, your focus, your attention span for driving is not good. So if you are fatigued, you need to have that heart-to-heart -heart conversation with dispatch or the supervisor and make a decision. Um, alert your partner, tell them, you know, I'm getting tired, I don't think I should be driving the ambulance and, and see if you can put that unit out of service until you feel capable of operating the vehicle safely. Now there are air medical operations, so if you're not able to transport that patient or the patient's condition warrants them to be taken to a specialized uh, care facility that's a good distance away from your, from your incident, then you may have to use an air medical service. There is two different types, of course, you have a fixed wing unit. This is usually the ones that are taken directly out of the airport um, from and, and done on inner facilities. It's very rare you ever see a fixed wing um, used for anything other than inner facility transfers. So we're talking a good example. One is, is the patient coming out of one tertiary care facility, fancy words, for a hospital that sits out in the middle of nowhere or uh, reference that is a band-aid station. You'll hear them call it a band-aid station. Not that that's professional, but there you go. Um, when they're cared for there, they're stabilized enough. Um, sometimes they'll call for a fixed wing to transport them. Uh, let's say you have a burn patient. That band-aid station managed to get them stabilized and now they need to be transported to a specialized burn center. And sometimes they'll use a fixed wing excuse me, a fixed wing aircraft to do that. The other thing that is used much more frequently 
is the helicopters or the rotary wings. These are the ones that can come directly to the scene and help you, um, or you can set up a landing zone where they can take over patient care is a little bit closer. Specialized trained crews accompany air ambulance flights. These are EMTs that provide ground support. Um, medical evacuation or medevac is performed by helicopters. Uh, the capabilities, protocols, and procedures vary. Why would you need to call for medevac? Well, if your transport time by ground is too long, maybe you have issues with road traffic or environmental conditions that is prohibiting ground transport, or the patient requires advanced care. Remember, I mentioned that. Multiple patients will overwhelm the resources that the hospital reached by ground transport, so maybe we have to um, divide and conquer and we have to share or spread the wealth. So if you have that mass casualty incident, you may be calling for air medical support to take some of those patients and transport them to facilities that are a little bit further away and able to handle that load. Patients with time-dependent injuries or illnesses, if these patients are critical, a good example is a stroke patient or someone who's suffering a massive heart attack, um, or maybe they've been involved in a, a serious motor vehicle collision and they have multiple injuries that are life-threatening. Those are patients that need to go to specialized care centers and those are not always easily accessible by ground. So it may be that you have an air medical crew come out and take those patients. Scuba diving accidents, near drownings, skiing and wilderness accidents, because usually you're talking about a rural area that's not close to any receiving facilities, those may require air medical support. Your trauma patients, we already mentioned that, and those that are candidates for limb repl replantation, burn centers, hyperbaric chambers also comes in, or venomous bite centers. So typically you're going to let dispatch know as soon as possible that you need me air medical because it takes them about 20 minutes to do their pre-flight checkoff and get set, set up and situated. So even if you suspect that you might need air medical, you can go ahead and put them on standby. They would much rather you give them the standby notice where they can set and prep and make sure that they're their their helicopter is set up the way it needs to be that you know the 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 um, pilot is able to do his pre-flight checkoff and have all of that done and they would much rather you do that and tell them they can stand down it's not as critical as you thought than to call them at the last minute and then they're beating um, everything down to try to get to you as quickly as possible if you should have to establish a landing zone you would like to have a hard or grassy surface that is level. Uh, it needs to be at l no less, no less than 60 by 60 feet, preferred 100 by 100 feet. So you want to have that nice 100 foot by 100 foot square. Cleared of loose debris, and I'm going to kind of giggle and smirk because you're always going to have some sort of loose debris. And probably one of the first things that you do as a brand new provider is go, oh, cool, we're landing a helicopter. I want to stand out here and watch it. And you wonder why your partner, who seems a little older, well, well versed in EMS, and he's sitting in the back of the um, or back inside the um, ambulance waiting for that helicopter to land. Well, it's actually because he's fully aware of the fact that there's going to be flying debris that's probably going to hit you and pelt you, and it's much safer and less painful if you're in the ambulance watching it land from inside where it's a little bit more safe for that loose debris. Um, you want to also make sure when you're setting up that LZ that you are clear of any overhead um, wires and cables or any tall hazards. Uh, clear of any trees to where they can get where they need to be. And I've seen some phenomenal helicopter pilots that can land. Uh, I've literally seen them land on a rock in the middle of New River Gorge um, to get a patient that uh, was involved in an, an incident out there. They, they can balance and do a lot of crazy things, especially if they have a lot of experience in their background or they were military pilots. 
Um, but we that doesn't excuse the fact that we want to make sure that we provide them with a landing zone that's as appropriate as possible. Mark the LZ with cones or vehicles and never use flares. You want to move any non-essential personnel and vehicles, kind of get them out of the area. Again, we're talking about equipment that can still, or, you know, uh, uh, debris that can still cause damage. Communicate the direction of strong wind to the, the flight crew if necessary. They'll usually try to get a hold of you through dispatch and tell you what channel they need you to turn to so that they can talk to you directly. Keep a safe distance from the aircraft whenever it is on the ground and considered hot. And they mean that the rotors are still in full, full blown mode. Um, you want to keep an eye directly on the pilot. The pilot will be the one to tell you when it is okay and when it is safe to approach. Do not approach the helicopter until you get the green light from the crew on board. Stay away from the tail rotor. Uh, that's where it's very difficult to see and you don't realize how close you are to it till you're actually there and that's when it's too late. Um, and people I've known of, of and, and I hate to say this has been many years ago, is when I first started in EMS, I remember finding out about someone who died because they approached that tail rotor and it split their face in half. So please, um, please stay away from the tail rotor. Always approach from the front. And remember the rotor blades can dip down to as low as four feet from the ground. So you've got to approach in a crouched position and become familiar with hand signals. Uh, just as I said before, you want to wait until you get the green light from the crew, the flight crew that you can approach. Make certain that all equipment and the patient are secured to the stretcher. There should be no smoking. Um, there should be no uh, do not wear hats or anything that can fly away or get caught up in that helicopter. Um, nothing with flames or flares within 50 feet and wear eye protection. And these are some examples of the um, hand signals that you may see. If you have to do a helicopter landing at night, make sure you're not spotlighting that helicopter. You don't want to shine anything uh, in the air. Allow them to do what they have to do because they all wear the night uh, night vision goggles. Direct low intensity headlights or lanterns toward the ground. Illuminate overhead hazards or obstructions if possible. Remember sometimes especially in West Virginia it's kind of hard to land on uneven uh, something that's completely flat. A lot of times it's it's uneven ground. But remember that whatever side, if you have no choice and you have to land that helicopter on uneven ground, remember that the main rotor blade is going to be closer to the ground on that uphill side. So you want to approach from the downhill slope. Medevacs at hazmat incidents. You need to notify the flight crew what they're coming into and consult about the best approach. Because the last thing you want to do for yourself and for that crew is to have that helicopter spin up any gases or anything that's hazmat related into the air. Uh, so the landing zone should be uphill and upwind and decon your patients before loading them on the helicopter. The helicopter crews will not appreciate it and neither will the owner of the helicopter uh, because it takes that helicopter out of service. Assess the severity of the weather or environment and terrain. Most hel helicopters are limited to flying at 10,000 feet above sea level. Your med medevac uh, helicopters can fly between 130 to 150 miles per hour, so they can actually drive and fly straight, go over the mountains. We don't have to worry about the curvy roads, and that makes it a lot quicker. Because the cabins can find space, assess the number and size of the patients who can be safely transported. In some cases, um, I don't know that it's nearly as prevalent now as it used to be, uh, but there were certain helicopters that could only take patients that were of a certain size or weight um, because they actually were not able to insert them into 
uh, the helicopter because of their size. We had, I remember one specifically where they were kind of pushing down on his belly to squeeze him through the hole. <clears throat> and also, it's not an opportunity for you to get lazy and send someone by helicopter. You want to make sure that it's medically necessary because the helicopters are extremely expensive in comparison to ground transport. <clears throat>